this is the time of the year that we are looking, looking. We're looking at the weather forecast to see if it's going to snow or be icy so we can get to church on Sabbath morning. We're looking for cards and packages in the mail. Some of us were looking for the batteries and instructions for the some assembly required packages. Some of us are looking forward to seeing friends and family and maybe even getting out to a celebration or two. For some of us, maybe we're looking for the perfect time to get away somewhere warm when it's not raining. Hmm. And some of us are already looking forward to spring and planning our garden and what we're going to plant next spring because the seed catalogs are coming. You know, we spend a lot of time waiting as well as we are looking, waiting, waiting in line, waiting for the doctor, waiting for the results of the medical test, waiting for the phone call, waiting to find out when somebody's going to come and visit, waiting for the package to arrive, waiting. Max Lucado puts it like this in his writing, Perhaps Today. The first Christmas was marked by lookers as well. Joseph was looking for lodging. Mary got to look into that prunish, wrinkled-up face of that newborn baby. Wise men looked for a star. But no one was looking with more intensity than a man named Simeon. We find the story of Simeon in Luke chapter 2, a little bit after the part of the Christmas story that we read most frequently. And it goes like this. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Now, unlike Joseph and Mary, Simeon did not witness Joseph's birth, or Jesus' birth. Unlike the wise men, he did not visit the child in Bethlehem. By the time he saw Jesus, the feeding stall was probably occupied only by animals, and the manger was back to holding hay. Mary and Joseph had probably begun to catch up on some of their sleep, and the shepherds were back tending their flock. Forty days had passed, and we can know with certainty that timing because of Jewish law. According to the Torah, the mother became ceremonially unclean upon the birth of her child. On the eighth day, a male child was circumcised. After an additional 33 days, the parents offered a sacrifice. So, In our terms, it was kind of a baby dedication. And it was at this dedication that Simeon saw Jesus. Now, Simeon was likely an old man, old and gray-haired, grizzled. The years had etched his skin, and he was wrinkled. He was probably slow in his step and bent over. But he was waiting for the day when God would take away Israel's sorrow, a day in which God would end the alienation of the people and reconcile them to himself. Simeon knew that this day would come in his lifetime because, verse 26 tells us, 
the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen him, God's anointed king. How did the Spirit tell Simeon? In a dream? In a vision? A scripture? We don't know. We do know, however, that Simeon lived with an eye to the future. The phrase, perhaps today, describes Simeon's attitude. He must have greeted each day with the thought that perhaps today was the day. He knew he would see the Messiah on earth before he saw the Father in heaven. And on the 40th day after Jesus' birth, that day arrived. The Spirit led Simeon to the temple. Perhaps he had other plans. Maybe he was going to stay home or visit with his grandchildren. But then there came a nudging, a knowing, a prompting, and he decided, I think I'll go to the temple. Simeon wound his way through the narrow streets, over the cobblestone paths. Finally, he entered the temple courts. Though Simeon ascended the temple steps a hundred times, the sight of Herod's masterpiece must have moved him. The massive stones, the gilded roof, the great colonnades. Even when it wasn't a holiday, the streets were full of worshipers and pilgrims. Somehow, in spite of the multitude, Simeon spotted Joseph and Mary. Now, no one else had a reason to notice the young parents. Angels did not cast petals or blast trumpets there was, at their arrival. Jesus did not ride on a pillow or in a chariot. He had no halo or glow or aura. He gurgled. He nursed. He slept in Mary's arms. Besides, any passerby had a more important task. People journeyed to the temple for one reason, to encounter God. No one imagined looking for God in the arms of a simple girl from Nazareth. No one, that is, except Simeon. Perhaps today, he whispered to himself as he saw them. He walked briskly across the temple courtyard, he excused his way through pilgrims and caught up with Joseph. Pardon me, he said. The Nazarene couple stopped and turned. May I? He gestured to the child. The same Holy Spirit that had nudged the older man prompted the younger man, and Joseph nodded. Mary gave Jesus to Simeon, and he took the baby in his arms and thanked God now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace, as you said. With my own eyes I have seen your salvation, which you prepared before all people. The Mag Magi, too, came looking. They were looking for the king of the Jews because they had read the prophecies and seen his star. And once Herod heard this, he, too, was looking for the baby that was a threat to his kingship. But now everything was different. The consolation of Israel had begun. The gate of history had swung on the hinge of a Bethlehem gate. The author of life had turned the page and was ready to write a new chapter. Simeon didn't know the name of the chapter, but we do. Scripture notes this period as the last days. Paul said, in the last days there will be many troubles. Peter urged us to understand what will happen in the last days. The author of Hebrews wrote, but now in these last days God has spoken to us through his Son. You know, we live between Advents. 
Advent is a word that describes, it means the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. Advent is what the Christmas season is called in many other Christian traditions. The second Advent will include a sudden, personal, visible, bodily return of Jesus Christ. Jesus promised, I will come again. The author of Hebrews declared, Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. As he came, Christ will come. But he won't come exactly as he came. He came quietly in Bethlehem. He will return in glory with a shout. All who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. In Bethlehem, the just-born baby Jesus slept. But when he returns, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. At his first coming, few noticed. At his second, all the nations of the world will be gathered before him. In Bethlehem, Joseph placed Jesus in a manger. At his return, Jesus will be seated on a throne. The Son of Man will come again in his great glory with all his angels. He will be king and sit on his great throne. What will happen next and what we hope for is what God promised, a new heaven and a new earth where justice reigns. You know, history is not an endless succession of meaningless circles, but a directed movement toward a great event. God has a timeline, and because of Bethlehem, we have an idea where we stand on that timeline. As the Apostle John said, my dear children, these are the last days. We enjoy the fruit of the first coming, but we anticipate the glory of the second. We refuse to believe that this present world is the sum total of human existence. We celebrate the first advent to whet our appetites for the second, and we long for that next coming. Now, some people say that they know the day and hour of Jesus' return. We don't. Plain and simple. We do know that the Bible urges us to look for specific signs that point to the return of Christ. The preaching of the gospel to all nations. Days of distress in which saints will suffer and the creation will tremble. The coming of the Antichrist, an enemy of God who will deceive many. Salvation of the Jews. Signs in the heavens. And false prophets. To a certain degree, each of these signs has seen fulfillment. The gospel has gone round the world. Many Christians experience severe oppression. The world has suffered at the hands of global villains, and many Jews have been saved. Our earth has shaken in birth pangs, and unfortunately the church has been weakened at times by false prophets. Certainly these signs will see further fulfillment, but this much is sure, the end is near. Or better said, the beginning is near. Tis the season to be looking not for some jolly man in a red suit, but for a grand king on a white horse. At his command, the sea will give up the dead, the devil will give up his quest, kings and queens will give up their crowns, broken hearts will give up their despair. 
and God's children will lift up their worship. Wise is the saint who, like Simeon, searches. If you knew that Jesus were returning tomorrow, how would you feel today? Anxious? Unprepared? If so, then you can take care of your fears by placing your trust in Jesus Christ. If your answer includes words like happy, relieved, and excited, then hold tightly to your joy because heaven is God's answer to any suffering you're going to face now. If you knew Jesus were coming tomorrow, what would you do today? Then do it. Live in such a way that you would not have to change your plans. This is God's invitation to us. He has prepared a place. He has a family of believers to love us. And he has a sparkling new world to show us one day. Who knows? This could be our day of delivery. Perhaps today. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth, the new thing that you will bring us into. And we are excited at that prospect, that it could be today. And Lord, uh, I pray that you will continue to help us to live as though you were returning tomorrow so that we need not make changes to our plans, but we will live in that productive relationship with you, looking forward. Lord, perhaps today. Amen.